Okay, ready. Yes, please. And uh, I give you the mic. Um, what I'm going to talk about uh, today is a concern around, I guess, the different types of uh, ecologies and more precisely urban ecologies in relationship to uh, architectural history. Um, we often think about um, uh, echo design, bio design or designing with uh, ecologies or multiple ecologies from the point of view of say landscape urbanism or contemporary forms of practice in and around, I guess, the uh, uh, contemporary knowledge systems that we have about uh, nature and the process oriented view of nature, um, as opposed to say more categorical abstractions or uh, commodification of nature. So what I'm gonna attempt to do today is try to bring together two different ways of understanding architecture, my own discipline, um, for people who might be interested. And the first one has to do with, I guess, uh, the history of architecture itself as a history of uh, both uh, decisions, but also within a stream of processes or flows. And to do that, I'm going to situate my talk um, in a way that is not explicitly just historical, um, but more an imaginative recreation of history um, of my hometown and the uh, laboratory that I'm quite fascinated with, the city of Chicago in the United States. Um, as a place where there's not only the development of modern architecture, but a lot of other engineering technologies as well. So the first part of this uh, major uh, component will be around thinking um, and imagining a history of Chicago um, in terms of uh, developments, processes, relationships. The second thing I will be attempting to do is to uh, work through those ideas of processes um, in relationship to the intellectual project of modernity. That is to say that architecture is not being proposed simply as a collection of buildings, influence, or style, uh, following a real estate model evaluation. Um, what we want to do is something a little more daring and try to propose and interpret and read into particular works of architecture, both um, the exemplary models and the everyday models, um, to talk about how, I guess, this idea of processes, um, this idea of ecologies, and this idea of relations um, plays out even in the most unusual or the most typical of situations. So part of this is about imaginative history, or we could even dare to say speculative history. And part of it will also be about the, the prospect or the possibility of thinking through uh, multiple ecologies by looking at specific works um, located in the present as well as the past. And in some cases, cohabiting the same space. So it'll make more sense, I hope, as I go through it. But what we're looking at right here is a part of Chicago that's perhaps very well known. This is a relatively contemporary aerial photograph. Um, and uh, it's taken from obviously right above an area that we call the loop. The loop is the densest part of the city, the historic, I guess, um, identity of the financial district, uh, the banking district, and the location of some of the highest density in this uh, major sprawling city. Um, it's located uh, in the American Midwest, uh, on the western part of the Great Lakes, on Lake Michigan. And it is um, a, uh, a city that's grown and right now is actually contracting a little bit in size, but a city that also has a punctuated equilibrium model of history, I would argue, um, of periods of dynamic change and transformations, and then some periods of stasis and uh, equilibrium as a historical model. And uh, 
it is a place that also has a particular um, significance uh, for me personally as, as you know, a place where I was born and grew up, worked as an architect and also practiced a bit, um, but also as a place that has developed um, some interesting projects of international significance and uh, probably too many to cover in today's talk, but we'll do our best. Um, so if you let me indulge me a bit. Uh, Chicago is not really a, a city in the sense of a bounded territory or terrain. Um, and I don't wanna talk about it today in terms of branding or marketing or those sorts of media ecologies. What I'm much more interested in discussing at this point is the way that the city itself has developed and even more precisely how the imagination of the city of Chicago is developed in the imagination of the architects and designers who are working through a complex ecosystem, a complex environment, and also in many cases, complex uh, economies that parallel or mimic these complex ecologies too. It is situated in the, uh, as I said, the lowermost part of the Great Lakes region and developed as a city of significance because of its hinge-like properties. It fuses together a couple of different ecosystems simply by its location um, and uh, from its small and perhaps unnoticed origin in William de Sable's uh, cabin, a freed, freed slave who settled in the region um, uh, before uh, the rest of the uh, industrialization came into play. Um, and it situates the American Midwest, the breadbasket with the Great Lakes, which was also the transportation hub for moving commodities particularly foodstuffs and agriculture from the American Midwest in the vast stretches um, into the processing situations and uh, uh, infra agricultural industrialization that happened in Chicago um, as those uh, commodities were moved across the Great Lakes, across the East Coast, and distributed in some cases worldwide. So the city is vast and it spreads out in multiple directions um, around uh, the core of the loop, which we're looking at, which is more or less dead center um, on the lake. Uh, the lakefront is public domain. It is an area that is owned by the city and shared collectively as a type of environment um, intended primarily for uh, the public, not for commercial endeavors. And if you look at it very closely, you can see it appears in its current configuration, the satellite view is a sprawling network, which it is. Um, the suburban sprawl outside of the uh, boundaries of Chicago proper and the, the suburban belt, uh, which is a result of things like uh, depopulation of the city center, particularly in the 70s, uh, white flight and uh, suburban growth, um, means that Chicago sprawls all the way to uh, adjoining states of Indiana and up to Wisconsin to the north. Um, when you come into Chicago, uh, one of the first things, if you're fortunate enough to come in at night, one of the first things you notice about it is the extensiveness of the grid. The grid system that organizes the city of Chicago is a mental device common throughout the American Midwest during the uh, development of the, the homesteading reappropriation of, of native lands into um, uh, territories and then later states. Um, this uh, uh, westward expansion of the United States as it moved through the American Midwest often followed this gridded system. And usually the only deviation from it because of the topographical monotony uh, would be something like an angled uh, train line in some small towns. But the grid used uh, democratically as a type of uh, neutral subdivision of space, or you could think of it as the recuperation of smooth space into something that is a striated environment. Uh, is quite legible when you come in on the airplane. It's just you know, a grid of streetlights that extends all the way to the horizon. And the only dark spot uh, in this infinite extension of grid, which looks like a video game if you come flying in at night, is the dead spot of Lake Michigan itself, a, a lake so large that you can't see across it. Um, and in many ways, conceptually operates more like a sea than a bounded body of water. As I mentioned, the origin of the city uh, as a, a construct is actually quite um, uh, well-known narrative story. And you can see the layout in this representation in 1820. Chicago is just a few dwellings constructed in the wilderness at the very important and significant point where the meeting of the uh, Chicago, uh, later the Chicago River, uh, which has tributaries that move into the Mississippi and the Great Lakes themselves, as you can see in the foreground. This kind of naive pictorial representation of a pre-industrial, pre-modern, uh, pre-settlement um, Illinois at least acknowledges the significance of the, uh, the prior uh, occupants of the land, um, the Illinois people, uh, 
First Nations groups um, that hunted and fished and uh, prospered in this area in a semi-nomadic lifestyle, I believe. And you can also see that the topography is relatively flat. It's marshy land on the edge of a lake and uh, in an area that's uh, riddled with rivers. If you go farther north, um, there's thousands of lakes of small scale. So it's an area that's quite saturated in terms of water. The water table is quite low to the surface of the city. And also for, the re for those reasons, um, it was quite unstable soil for construction, at least in the uh, original uh, settlements. We're looking at a map that shows us um, an exaggeration of the different sorts of transport hubs available by the mid 1800s um, in the United States. The blue represents the connections of different shipping lines and the width of those lines indicates the volume. And the black shows us, if we look closely, the black shows us the major transportation hubs that occur, primarily the American railroads as the, uh, the Eastern and the Western lines were finally connected um, and formed a, a uh, infrastructure, an agricultural infrastructure primarily across the, um, all of the uh, 48 contiguous states they eventually became. Uh, these went through territories uh, as a means of connection and as a very explicit uh, transportation network, bringing people west and bringing commodities to the east. And by merging these two in this, this map, um, which is slightly subjective, you can also start to see the significance of the uh, vast network of rail lines, but also the uh, volume that occurs on, on the seas because shipping things by land was still much more expensive than shipping them by water. So ports were particularly important. And if you look in the upper part of this map, the figure that looks like a blue horse, the front legs of that is actually Lake Michigan. If you look at the red profiles, you can see the contemporary geological or geographical boundaries of the, the country. And uh, as you see, the, uh, the point of, of touching of the, uh, the blue lake distributed to the East Coast um, is at that city of Chicago, which as you can see has vast rail lines coming in and through it. It's a type of terminus, although that name is used for the city of Atlanta, the southern stretch, um, and is a place where, um, in many ways, as a hinge, it brought together different transportation infrastructures, but also is a place where the meeting of the land and the sea, but also in a place that maps onto a fundamental uh, schism in different geographies, different densities, too. East of Chicago is, tends to be urbanized, and west of Chicago tends to be agricultural. So it occupied a very particular pivot point that allowed for a huge flow of different types of uh, commodities, different types of ideas, different types of people. So Chicago, although it's you know sometimes called the fourth city, um, or the, it's the third largest city as the, um, the third city in the ocean, perhaps, a place where uh, you feel in some ways separate from the other coast, but still has a kind of coastal turbulence and dynamism you find in a lot of greater cities. So one of the ecologies um, that was artificially created was not just agriculture, but specifically um, the uh, meat and uh, the secondarily the dairy industries. What you're looking at here is a vast complex of holding pens for cattle as they were shipped in live from across the United States and brought to Chicago for processing into meat and sausages and then uh, used in different preservatives, canned most often, and distributed through the rest of the, uh, uh, the states. So uh, in anticipation of this highly industrialized process of converting um, domesticated cattle into food products, um, the storage area called the stockyards, as you can see here, was organized using the most advanced industrial and space planning techniques available at the time which were paradoxically the same sort of grid system that was used for laying out city streets and laying out other sorts of um, territories in the environment. As a consequence, we see some sort of interesting parallel between the distribution, the even distribution and the countable metrics grid based system of subdivisions of properties into spaces for accounting reasons, but also for allocations of resource being used for the cattle as well as for the uh, north of this area, because this is in the south Chicago, the stockyards are um, a big complex in the south. Um, this is an area that also anticipates um, the, I guess, the development of uh, new forms of uh, not just uh, dining cultures. Um, Chicago has been called a metropolis 
uh, because of the, uh, the significance of the, uh, the food industry, uh, but also a lot of the engineering and, and techniques that were developed for urbanization were also tested out as agriculture moved from a pre-industrial to an industrial mode. So at its heyday, the Chicago stockyards had vast numbers of trains coming in with the same frequency and regularity you would expect in a contemporary airport. And Chicago's O'Hare, as you may know, is one of the busiest in the world still to this day, um, organized with incredible precision to convert large amounts of biomass here into foodstuffs um, using a often a pre-electric, uh, pre-air conditioned uh, range of technologies. Um, the stockyards were notorious for being a driver of the economy, um, as well as a, a particularly foul environment. Um, my mother growing up in the South Side um, in the 20th century pointed out that uh, when the wind shifted on certain days, you couldn't help but get sick because of all of the smells coming from the stockyards and they lived miles away from it too. So we have to understand that, you know, there's no, um, I guess, consequence-free territorialization of the smooth space of the environment for industrialization. And in this case, the uh, transference of, uh, of wealth and the distribution of functional space for this industrialization process gave rise to a lot of uh, environmental damage, um, as well as some recent considerations of the other consequences too. If we look on the left, we can see a small data chart that I've pulled up that I think is quite telling for understanding the growth of this modern city. And it meets most of the definitions of a modern city, which I'll try to explain quickly. Um, the first one is that if you look at the uh, population, see how it starts to grow in a very significant way from the 1850s um, uh, with the development of this turn towards the uh, railroads and later the industrialization of agriculture, which led to the industrialization of construction sites, industrialization of housing, industrialization of media. So this process of mechanization, as many art historical and architectural scholars have pointed out, is a fundamental shift, not just in the mode of production, but in the ecologies that circulate in and around the modes of production. So the idea of hand crafting things or hand making things will grow up in the place. Uh, and distributed. This applied to everything from sausages to even the idea of um, So that continuous, not a continuous nor a smooth process, again, a punctuated equilibrium of developments of different technologies that would transform a particular industry and then displace it and through technology transfer innovation start to show up in other places. Uh, we'll talk about that in terms of the Chicago frame for a bit. But if you just look at the population numbers, you can see see how from each decade it's more than doubling as you race from the uh, more or less the origin of modern architecture and urbanism in the 1860s, uh, the time of the Civil War, um, to the uh, 1870, the time of the uh, Great Fire, 1871, as you see there, and then the city's astronomical growth to 1910, um, when it became one of the densest cities in the world. You can see listed there, uh, 1890, it was the second biggest city in all that place, uh, that world in the US until the 1980s. Um, so what we have is a place that is growing faster than uh, obviously could be designed. And some, uh, because of the strain on resources, whether they're uh, tangible or intangible resources, the strain on resources created perpetual crisis and a constant pull or um, attraction towards systems of automation and systems of industrialization. And so innovation was driven out of necessity more often than simply uh, market research or some uh, models of, of income growth. And the, the Great Fire in many ways changed everything because of the time that it happened uh, and the, the severity of the damage also caused people to rethink some of the fundamental bases for the construction of cities that led to a series of circumstantial decisions that gave rise to things as we shall see as tall buildings and urban densification using new materials. The fire itself was a horrific event. Um, a large portion of downtown was destroyed, the area called the Loop, and a vast number of people died. The fire jumped across the river. So a lot of people that were fleeing the Loop toward, towards River North um, across the bridges, taking whatever they could take with them, uh, created a uh, traffic jam. And as the fire spread and as people um, uh, 
went on to the try to cross the small number of bridges across the river. Um, the river itself, as a barrier, uh, didn't prevent the flames from leaping across. And so people were trapped on both sides of the river, even though their instincts were to go there for safety. Um, so it was a, a double dead end situation. It was a massive loss of life in a short period of time. And the fire got so hot, leaping from embers from roof to roof, most of the buildings burned from the top down. Um, and most of the buildings had in their uh, building envelopes, they tended to be brick or stone, but most of the structural systems tended to be timber. And so what happened is the buildings would burn from the inside and from the top. Um, and, and the ones that did last or survive, survived simply as ruins. This is a contemporary map showing the spread We have some technical difficulties and we'll be back in a few seconds probably. I hope the, uh, the internet connection will be uh, very good from now on. You never know. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Can we see and hear the presentation? Uh, yes. Good. Now, now we can uh, hear it and see it. Now, now it's a fire in Chicago. Yes. So this is the uh, illustration of the newspapers after the event, showing the desperation of people fleeing the fire from either the uh, mostly from the Loop area towards River North, um, and the congestion that was caused on the few narrow number of wooden bridges across Summer Iron across the river um, and the flames that had leapt across the river. And I was explaining, I think before the power went out, that uh, the buildings would catch the flames on the top and then burn from the top down uh, in terms of the roofs and the whole structure. In this map, which I don't think people saw, this is a reconstruction of the direction using the forensics that was available at the time after the fire to analyze it. Uh, it did start around Taylor Street, which was a high density uh, urban area of housing and spread um, across uh, the first river, jumped uh, the river into the loop area, decimated the loop because of the strong winds and the, the dry uh, air. Um, at that point, the winds were moving towards the lake and not into the city itself. And the flames moved and marched along the direction of the winds and then jumped again across two of the bridges that, that caught fire into the River North area, as you can see there. So uh, area H and I, uh, and it spread as far north as Chicago Avenue. Um, if you walked the distance of the uh, area that's damaged, I'd say, I guess, somewhere between an hour, an hour and 15 minutes uh, walking, at least at my pace, um, from the two ends. So it's a huge portion of the city. Most of the core um, was destroyed, and the fire burned for over two days and nights. Um, many ways creating a, uh, a historical trauma that was you know, visible with scar tissue for many decades afterwards. Some of the photography, and that was a relatively new technology available at the time of the fire in the 1970s, um, shows the, uh, the decimation a couple of days after the uh, fire had, had burned out. Um, and this is the point where the buildings that are more or less still standing uh, as uh, ruins or as husks um, this kind of uh, um, burnt environment uh, is now displaced into scrap materials, uh, sorted and uh, removed from the site. Um, so in many ways, the city was razed to the ground and people were forced to start over. 
Um, and start over they did. There were some changes to the building codes as a consequence of this that villainized timber frame and prioritized people to look for other sorts of fireproofing techniques to make sure it wouldn't happen again. Uh, one of the consequences was also that uh, through insurance or other techniques, a lot of the buildings that were lost were replaced with much larger buildings. And this also was dependent on things like the uh, patenting of the uh, elevator by Otis, which was demonstrated in the World Fair just a few years before that, which allowed the replacement of uh, endless staircases with uh, something of a hydraulic lift and later, first of all, the pulley base lift and later the hydraulic lift. Here you can see the, the demographics again, showing the projection um, up to uh, quite recently population of the city, as I mentioned, it grew. And you can see that astronomical growth, which included, if you look at the lower left-hand side, uh, dash 70, the fire didn't seem to do much to the population. Um, it was only with the reconstruction after the fire that you start to see the population spiking from 1880 all the way up to the period of the Great Depression in the 1920s. So that continuous and astronomical growth uh, carried through, um, which was part of the development of not just rapid urbanization, densification, but the transformation of the city of Chicago itself as a consequence of densification would include changes to everything from the local microecologies um, to the vast number of people who were displaced and moved, moving in and out of the city, and as well as an increased growth of immigrants. Um, and it's anecdotal, but most people will know that the largest number of immigrants to Chicago during that period, particularly uh, leading up to the 1920s, were from Poland. And there's still large sections of the city that have Polish-speaking populations, although not as large as they used to be when my grandparents lived there. This is a map that shows the rail network which came into the city and also became kind of a spider web, right, radiating out from the city. So you can imagine that the city itself is part of this vast network, this infrastructure of the railroad. So the railroads form their own sort of infrastructural ecology. They connected and traversed different territories and different regions um, by going from hub to hub. Um, and we know that that transformation of the environment, uh, which you can read about in Leo Marx's Machine in the Garden, which is a great explanation, transformed everything from the development of uh, timetables um, to the uh, public perception and imagination about the uh, Wild West and American uh, eminent domain to expand as far west as possible. Chicago stands as a, an entanglement in terms of infrastructure, but also environmentally, it is more of an overlapping, in both the agricultural as well as the uh, biological systems as they come into play here, um, the vast uh, forms of different sea life um, associated with the Great Lakes before the industrialization created a pollution situation. Uh, were quite substantial. And one of the things that happened with rapid urbanization was the uh, a lot of the waste systems as they started to be distributed in, for it from uh, the city itself into the lake. And it was only recognized later that this was a cause of not just disease, but starting to do ecological damage. And so the decision was made to reverse the flow of the Chicago River instead of the polluted water of the Chicago River. And most of the light industrial followed the um, the networks uh, of the waterways and the railroads. So you can think of there's two different systems here, two different movement systems. And this is before the development of cars and before the development of the highway system, which would be a third one uh, post-World War II. So you've got your waterways and you've got your railroads as two different networks superimposed, interlocking and intermeshing across the American Midwest. But what happened in Chicago is because of the pollution that followed these, these natural lines, uh, a place where often industry is located, uh, the, the pollution that went into Chicago River, the reversal of it, there's great documentaries about this. They basically decided to run the water and the rivers reverse by building a lock system where the Chicago River enters like Michigan. And right now, there's still some very significant turn of the century uh, architecture and urban space to mark that area. And when I work with Chicago Parks District, I uh, spent a lot of time building a model um, of that dynamic uh, area because the reversal of the river was seen as a necessity. It's a type of, I guess, terraforming, if you think about it, but certainly a hydraulic engineering to reverse the flow of the river to accommodate the perception of the danger of, the, of disease and pollution in the lake was a first step towards an environmental rebalancing done as a feat of engineering. And so on this representation, you can see the balloons eye representation of Chicago in the 1870s. 
um, after the fire, but before the development of the skyscraper. And you can see, if you look at it, the relentless grid um, drawn infinitely extending to the horizon um, and uh, the, the lock uh, system here in the front, uh, barely visible uh, for the Chicago River as it moves through the city too. So you, you now you've got a third system starting in, the, in Chicago, which is the grid of the streets, which creates a much more uniform and regular way of, I guess, movement and control systems uh, and creates these micro environments, these different neighborhoods, which over time uh, took on very different characters as different immigrant groups moved in and uh, populated these different neighborhoods. By the turn of the century, by 1900, Chicago was certainly an urban environment and becoming a modern city. What made it modern was a couple of very significant uh, transformations. The office building, and particularly the tall office building, which included in the case of Chicago, a relatively unornamented and uh, more of a solid, I call it a meat and potatoes type of uh, pragmatic architecture. Um, the buildings, if they had any ornamentation or detail, were done in a style that was vaguely neo-Romanesque. Uh, the building typology of the warehouse was still the dominant form for urban constructions, whether it was housing or um, office buildings or other sorts, even department stores tend to follow the warehouse typology. Um, and as such, it didn't have those strong neoclassical or historicist tendencies because of the rate of construction or technically reconstruction done in the golden age of Chicago modernism, 1880s to 1900, when many uh, visionary architects were working for uh, very tough clients who wanted to maximize the volume and leasable square footage of the buildings and weren't too concerned with spending finances on ornament when it was more important that the buildings performed in a functional way and maintain structural integrity to comply with the rigorous building codes that evolved as a consequence of the fire. So in this urban environment, you can imagine that everything from wildlife um, to pollen counts would change significantly with densification, with urbanization. The Monadnock building, if you look at this building here, is kind of a, an interesting hybrid building. The first part of the by burning root, and it uses a load-bearing masonry structural system on the exoskeleton of brick. You can see that the building on the, looking at the, that side um, on the right image, uh, the temple type plinth or podium it sits on is constructed as on the corners, this load-bearing brick that flares out um, like bell-bottom jeans to meet the ground. And there used to be a really cool bar in there that only architects hung out in, but it's, it's moved away since I was practicing it. The back half or back third of the building, which you can see in the left photograph um, as it was uh, finishing construction, has changed and it's got more load bearing structure on the inside, but it's still hidden and concealed because it was a new technology that's associated with a lot of risk. You'll notice also the bay windows, the Chicago style office windows you see, which was developed to solve two problems. As buildings became longer and deeper and taller, people's access to the outside was minimized. They started to become sealed micro environments and interiors. And the way to fight against that was operable windows. But the operable windows in a long span structure like this, or at least in a long, uh, I guess a, a bay structure repeating um, in, at length in horizontal and vertical axes, uh, this sort of uh, structural system and this sort of building typology uh, was dependent on passive systems. So operable windows, and cross ventilation was still the best way to get light and air into them. The third typological invention um, that made the Chicago office building work, and we don't have this in the Monadnock, but I have it in the other ones we show, was the idea of the atrium, which acted like a thermal chimney. So for these buildings to actually be occupiable in terms of thermal comfort and delight, following the Vitruvian principle, you need to have projecting bay windows that catch sunlight and also uh, cross breezes. And so to maximize the uh, uh, the surface, not area, but the surface volume uh, was the technical solution to this. The steel framing technology that was developed, the Chicago frame as it was called by Colin Rowe, uh, followed from translations from engineering uh, technology into the development of this infinitely repeatable system where you can see a hybrid of concrete slab stabilizing a structural framing system that used highly efficient steel. Uh, you know, there's also the significance here of the fireproofing, the fundamental components, the use of welds, a vast industry 
grew out of this uh, steel framing. And the hypothetical story of the origin of this came from the uh, development of the rail lines that once the American Midwest was saturated with rail connections, the steel industries as close as Gary, Indiana, which is the adjoining city east of Chicago, had to shift their market from uh, rail to uh, the possibility of uh, uh, architecture and engineering. And so there's a similarity, as you can see, as an apocryphal story between the structural beams and girders and the rails used in the uh, uh, rail industry, the railroad industry, as a technology transfer that gave rise to this entirely new way of conceiving a building based on framing. And more than just framing, the repetitive grid that we saw in all of the organizational spaces of Chicago, the repetitive grid being repeated and arrayed in three dimensions as a, a basically a structural frame, or you can think of it as a wire frame, of which the spaces between them, because they're no longer structural, have infinite flexibility to be subdivided or perform different sorts of, of functions. You can see that in the, uh, the first office buildings, the first skyscraper pioneered in Chicago in the Reliance building, and the way that the steel framing, um, here you can see the attic drawing on the right, uh, allows the building to maintain uh, both a, a central core and that uh, very heavily um, articulated bay window, the Chicago window exterior, um, creating something of an urban ecology in and of itself. This building manipulates and deliberately follows that emerging topology where the uh, the flow of light and air um, is something that is done as a deliberate design decision um, and brought into play with things such as plate glass window, the, uh, later the Otis elevator patented technique, uh, the atrium. So it's a mixture or a combination of different technologies to solve environmental issues that came to become the basis for the tall building um, through the early 20th century. One of my favorite buildings, um, not technically a skyscraper, and it was a mixed use in terms of office and retail, and it still is that today, is the rookery uh, done by Burnham and Root. Um, if you look at the uh, photograph of the outside, it still is roughly the same condition. Uh, there are some references to the Beaux-Arts system in terms of the articulation of the central axes um, in both directions. There's uh, rusticated corners, including bricks and terracotta that both uh, turn the corner, but also hold the corner depending on your level, and some overtures to Romanesque uh, um, detailing near the top. But for all intents and purposes, and you see a lot of buildings like this in Chicago and Philadelphia, the warehouse, not the temple, is the precedent for this form of construction. You can see even that attempt to you know, transform the Renaissance uh, um, stacking that you see in Palazzo's um, in the Renaissance in Italy uh, being interpreted here, which is different bandings that describe potential zones of the building for functions and use and purposes. And a close-up of the detailing, <coughs> showing how the development of industry led to a, 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 just a, an expectation of a minimalization of ornament, often done in a tactical sense. So a lot of the warehouse type buildings, even tall buildings that were developing in Chicago, had a no-nonsense minimalist use of ornament. And the ornament almost always was done on these boundary edge or threshold conditions where the inside and the outside come together. So the same thing you see in biological systems where the inside and the outside of an organism uh, evolves or develops with very highly specialized either sense organs or other sorts of systems, uh, the tactical use of ornament, um, again, for, mostly for cost and for a certain sort of modesty that was expected um, of architects in an emerging democratic and uh, rapidly urbanizing environment used very little ornament and the ornament that was used tended to be quite repetitive. Something that also talks about maybe a subconscious appropriation of the machinic repetition of industrialization and the uniform grids and uniform systems that were used to maintain an equilibrium and predictability to all processes of making and all processes of creation that were being made available in industrialization as the city rapidly urbanized. The inner courtyard um, done in a very different uh, almost uh, uh, gazebo or uh, a glass atrium type construction you would associate with landscapes. Um, the uh, conventional wisdom is that this is actually a commissioned project uh, that was secretly done by Frank Lloyd Wright as one of his first designs. And you can see the strong Victorian influence in everything from the uh, perforated steel girders across the top of this glazed atrium uh, to the use of the ornament on the different stair uh, balustrades and rails. Um, something that we're also uh, seeing a lot of Louis Sullivan's work 
Um, but the lightness and transparency of the interior and the fact that this is a, conceived of as a small little um, a vestibule or a jewel box in the middle of this uh, no-nonsense building. Because if you look back, um, it's actually hollow in the center. If you look at the plans on the left in the section underneath it, this building is actually a donut. It's not a completely solid building. So topologically, that center core becomes a thermal chimney and a source of interior light for the floor plates as well. So it's actually a four-sided, four different linear buildings all interlocking. And only in the lower levels of the public atrium here do you have what is actually choice real estate. Louis Sullivan uh, developed a, a different technology, and uh, this was his office at one point in the tower up above the auditorium building. It was uh, one of the last offices he practiced architecture in Chicago. This building, like the uh, Burnham and Roof one we just saw, is also comes from that same era of that ru rugged neo Romanist uh, style and also that warehouse typology. But this one actually is, in some ways, uh, even more daring because he's taken the idea of the office building, or at least uh, the urban uh, block and inserted a variety of different programs into this building, including the auditorium that it's named at. Currently it holds an art school, offices, showrooms, and some other variety of programs. But on the outside, you get the idea of a regular uniform and uh, pretty consistent building type with the cross sections and the interior are radically different. The exterior condition, including the tower, uh, holds that typological allegiance towards the warehouse, even for this most noble of public institu institutions, not the opera house, which is a block away, but an auditorium building for shows and performances. As it sits today, it looks almost again like an understated warehouse. Um, but the cross section is the secret. It's actually got one, two, three, four different structural systems. Um, hidden inside the building. So it's actually an assemblage of different buildings with a uniform core of the auditorium itself. You can see the, uh, the fly room and the seating in the main center and then the front facade and the front building, which floats structurally separate from the buildings at the back too. So it's actually a building composed of wrappings, wrappings of volumes of space following that same sort of structural logic and construction logic of the warehouse a hollow core, but like unlike the Mananat, or unlike the um, a rookery building here, the hollow core is filled with the actual auditorium space itself. There you can see a little more closely the relationship between the secret center and the uh, uniform exterior of this fascinating building, and the fact that each of these was separated in terms of their structural systems, also their ornamental systems, because Sullivan was one of the more daring of the modern the first to write about modern architecture using that language, roughly around the same time that Otto Wagner was writing using the same term in Vienna. And there's some stylistic similarities, I think, between some of Wagner and uh, Sullivan's work from that same era of the 1880s. If we look at the interiors, you can start to see how this modern sensibility also plays out. There's references to the neoclassical world, but Sullivan was an eclectic, deliberately so. He had no qualms and actually celebrated the combining of different ornamental systems, different material systems, even different religious and philosophical systems as an expression of his intellectual freedom and in search for a language of democratic architecture in a rapidly industrializing society. At a time when people and commodities were pushing towards homogeneity or similarity, Sullivan stood against that tendency and against that movement, trying to create each space and each building with a unique singularity and a stylistic ensemble uh, that was often admired but rarely duplicated. And so you can see even here with the later introduction of electric lights, uh, the development of one of the first attempts at air conditioning, putting blocks of ice in front of fans and such, that the building was attempting to try to straddle the expectation of the modesty of the urban civic project with Sullivan's personal flair for the idiosyncratic and the esoteric and finding ways to do the idiosyncratic and esoteric techniques and technologies using increasingly repetition and machine generated forms. For example, if you look at some of the detail in here, everything from punched metal to structural uh, uh, steel uh, to some of the load bearing components of the building look for example, at the intricateness of the balustrades and rails on the stairs, understanding that they are now mass produced. And he used to do one-to-one -one scale drawings for the shop um, manufacturers and mark them up to get all of the details and proportions because he was interested in forming new languages and new grammars and shape grammars 
at the scale of ornament, but only where the body touched the building or where the inside touched the outside. So he's using a lot of biological technologies or these biological imperatives in an intuitive sense and looking for a way to create a synthetic nature by studying the patterns and geometries of nature, but abstracting them and constructing them or having them assembled more than constructed, having them assembled as industrial outcomes in systems that were self-consistent self and logically pure. At the same time, if you look on the right, the use of the different structural columns in close proximity talks about his imagination and his spatial plasticity and his belief in a variety of forms of expression. Here, the structural column is an oversized capital to highlight the massive weight of the different beams and slabs above it and how those are being elegantly distributed. There's something mannerist about this in the, in the language perhaps of Furness and others, um, exaggerating their constructedness and also calling attention to the fact that they fall outside of any of the proportional or stylistic concerns of the Beaux-Arts logic. His affinity was not towards the Beaux-Arts or the coded language of neoclassicism, but towards a rugged and honest expression based on synthesizing different systems and creating what I call an artificial natural system into the built environment as a proposition or as an experiment. And you can see this, for example, in his cleverly hidden uh, initials, Louis H. Sullivan, in the uh, building, the Carson Fury Scott building, that was called the department store. Um, and each of those fragments of ornament, as you can see there, based on biological forms, drawn and, and redrawn with great care and attention to be manufactured and produced out of molten steel, molten hot iron, and then uh, uh, brought to site and attached and clipped onto the structural frame of the building. This is a tour de force of development of personal language that is not just organic, but anticipates a certain entanglement of different cultural codes and different expectations about the significance of nobility in architecture, particularly, again, tactically used at the thresholds between inside and outside. A close up of some of the detailing. Um, you can find this often done in terracotta or in iron um, in different parts of his buildings throughout his career. Um, it almost looks like a, a vegetal system, but you can see that it's deliberately man-made and recalls different geometries, Romanesque, um, even in some cases Sumerian detailing, uh, references to Druids and other uh, systems, I guess, visual codes that are quasi-biological to talk about the intellectual project of the ecological imperative, as I see it in Sullivan's work. Going through some of the fire images. Um, and uh, this is a map of that, that area uh, that was burned through. Um, this is a quick stylistic impression of what changed after Sullivan. And that is the Great White Exposition of 1893. Well, Daniel Burnham got to redesign the city of Chicago, at least along the waterfront, as a type of, uh, I guess, experimental return to a false past. And uh, what happened here is the ascendancy of the Beaux-Arts model of the neoclassical, a series of temporary buildings uh, assembled for the World's Fair to announce Chicago's rebirth from the, uh, the flames, because it was such a traumatic experience that most people assumed that Chicago had burned to the ground and had stayed there. And so it was a, a very much a media event um, to reconstruct or to construct hypothetically some new buildings and pavilions to create a World's Fair, an exposition to demonstrate all these different cultural and technological advances, and even Sullivan did a project there. Many of these were built out of temporary materials intended to last just for one season, uh, but some of the more popular buildings were rebuilt later out of stone. The Burnham approach, to oversimplify it, was to recreate something like a Venice, to take advantage of the aquatic nature of the lakefront, and to use Venetian-style uh, Renaissance-influenced building types, which are quite alien in terms of the climate, they're quite alien in terms of the typologies, and they're quite alien in terms of the uh, shape, grammar, and ornamental language that you would find in the rest of Chicago, or we would say, you know, the, the native Chicago. Um, and what you have here is something that's complete artifice and fantasy land. Even the landscaping and the uh, waterscaping and, and other elements are being influenced by not the East Coast, but the Beaux-Arts School that drove a lot of the East Coast architects. So there's a much more politics involved here too, between the organic approach of Wright, Sullivan, and those modern architects operating in Chicago in kind of a free form search for a uh, organic architecture of integrity fit for democratic society, and this uh, coded language of power and imperialism of the neoclassical 
being brought in for cultural institutions as a type of, I guess, quasi enlightenment for what is basically a working class city from the Chicago um, of no nonsense, uh, strong stick and skin type of modern architecture. So the Burnham design and its extension into the Burnham plan uh, for the uh, Parisian or Venetian transformation of the city is in some ways, as Sullivan said, set architecture back by a generation because of the popularity of this populist architecture, which recall, again recalls the East Coast of maybe Washington DC or that coded style of, of the neoclassical as a, a uniform system of expression of power, which stretches from DC through Paris uh, London, all the way to even St. Petersburg in Russia, you can find very similar expressions of cultural institutions in that language, reversed or at least halted the organic experiment in architecture for quite a while in Chicago as people started to move back towards this historical, I guess, uh, re rebalancing or recalibration in terms of an architecture in search of a style. So uh, we see the same thing happening at the edge of the late modern and postmodern, where history is you know, brought back by some architects as missing matter, or as, you know, lost traits or characteristics of expression, if you want to talk about the biological, um, and a stronger pushback from people who are convinced that uh, the pragmatic approach, both philosophically, economically, but also aesthetically, is the appropriate one for the city of Chicago. And there you can see the largest public plaza, not constructed, as an attempt to reconfigure that infinite extent, expanse of the gridded system of Chicago here into a radiating system of streets, more Paris than Chicago, as a fantasy, as you know, a, I would say an invasive species of urbanism that was unsuccessfully proposed and never fully realized. Although the Burnham plan you know, keeps recurring in a lot of architectural talk and uh, drawings and models too. So it's also a phantom limb type of situation where the unrealized Burnham plan still is a figure haunting most of the urban design and urban architecture in the city of Chicago. Chicago, the modern metropolis, grew out of this search for not style, but for efficiency. And it became a style unto itself. As the tall building, the Jazz Age, as Tafuri called the 1920s, started to give rise to new and much more stylistically eclectic buildings, uh, even as far as if you look at the competition entries for the Chicago Trib Tower, which you know, Gropius has submitted one of the most austere and uh, Hood and others um, moved towards neo-Gothic and neo-classical stylistic uh, I see on cakes. Um, but most of the city of Chicago developed as an industrial city um, as a financial power, and again, because of the translation of different agricultural products into uh, commodities sold to the East, um, it was a city that made a lot of middlemen quite prosperous. It was a place for informal deals, backroom deals, and a very laissez-faire attitude towards regulation and uh, government, uh, even through the Capone era, it was quite well known. And even now, I think you know, Chicago has a history of having some pretty rough characters in leadership roles um, and has had such for, for quite a long time. The loop itself as it developed became high density and a prototype of a, a not a compact city, although it is a walkable area, but it, there's something unusual about the loop when you look at this map. Um, Lake Park uh, in this, this map. So this is the orientation of north is to the right. Lake Park is now Millennium Park. Um, and that is also the location for some, but not all of the, uh, the Burnham's the designs of the Great White Exposition. But the ecology of the, this uh, miniature island um, has shifted over time significantly. There's actually a building uh, moratorium. There's not much constructed between World War II and the 1980s in the loop either. So in some ways it stays or is preserved as a palimpsest, there's a layer of different incomplete plans and incomplete visions of different versions of modernity. So it has a little bit of a, a heterogeneous, uh, I guess, mixture of different approaches towards buildings and building ecologies. And its urban ecology is not anything like a pedigree, but it's quite the mutt in terms of a mixture of things in close proximity. You get these sorts of urban conditions. Um, uh, in Chicago, even through the, the middle of the 20th century and in the later 20th century, where you will have some ambiguity or uncertainty about frontality, about scale, about modernization and historicism, about what gets modified, what gets demolished. And so the city has an eclectic quality, particularly in the loop as you look here. Um, in the background, you can see the jeweler's building in that top part, I believe is Al Capone's office later, and uh, one of the office towers there. Venetian skyscrapers that came to replace it. And uh, now, what's missing from the skyline, unfortunately, is uh, Trump Tower, which has been built by 
in the majority of the world. You can also see, you know, if we look at the vehicles, the uh, uh, transportation hub just inserted in here, right next to the Chicago theater. So kind of an ad hoc urbanism, uh, not of the uh, popular sorts. It was uh, valorized by Venturi and Scott Brown in their writings about Las Vegas, but this is more of a, an urban necessity of close proximity, densification, and historical layering of new building typologies. Um, upon the existing fabric of what was both a new city in 1871 burned to the ground and interpreted, but also a modern city. It's a working city for working class people and the city had to work and all the components of the buildings and all the components of the streetscapes and the civic realm had to work uh, with a strong sense of civic pride that's still evident in the, in the people of Chicago and the strong protection of all the public spaces, including all of the waterfront is still public space and over 80 public parks distributed through the city and all the museums are all considered public property and part of the, that, uh, I guess, the, the communal uh, nature of citizenship that is based in uh, Chicago culture. This is the former Sun-Times building. Uh, it was a fascinating building to visit as a young architect when I was working there. You can see the, uh, the Wrigley building behind it um, and uh, the uh, Chicago Trip Tower poking out behind that one as well. Um, the Sun Times building had the entire printing press for the newspaper in the lower level. So you could walk along the whole length of the building and watch all of the issues being printed on this massive printing press, which they had to dismantle at great expense and replace it with an office building. Um, you can also see the contemporary bridges, the bridges of all of, of Cook County um, uh, that span the river. And these are all operable bridges too, because quite a few times during the year, large ships will go up and down the Chicago River here. This is the one where they reverse the flow. And this is the bridge that replaces the one that burned down in the Great Fire connecting the loop um, to River North. This is a sunset along, I think this is State Street. Um, but this is the, the street canyons that were created by keeping the same street pattern and the densification of urbanism that happened in this environment um, in the later part of the 20th century. Um, and this is the Chicago that, that I know and, and enjoy quite well. Um, this is the uh, elevated trains. Um, one of the least expensive architectural tours you can take in Chicago is to get on a train and uh, it moves above ground, particularly in the loop, because when it was developed as a, not a subway system, but above ground, it's because the, uh, the water table was uh, not, wouldn't easily accommodate subterranean construction, but also no one was willing to um, give up the uh, pilings or the uh, basements for their buildings. And most of the buildings in downtown Chicago in the loop have not only have basements and an upper and lower basement, uh, but like in Lower Wacker Drive, there's a whole other set of streets beneath the city. Uh, many of them are closed off after September 11th attack uh, for security reasons, but you can still get down into the subterranean levels. But they had to build the elevated train above ground and it goes between buildings, sometimes like a roller coaster in harrowing proximity and does a couple sharp turns, uh, but it also spreads out uh, octopus-like down different tentacles across uh, most of the city now too, and even out to the suburbs. Um, so it's still a very uh, efficient form of transportation, the elevated, uh, or L as it's called for short. Uh, much loved and much maligned. Um, I guess one of the most fundamental mechanisms in the city that allows for people to move in and through. And as the, the elevated train line developed, um, as it was brought into other neighborhoods, it brought prosperity with it. It also brought uh, um, uh, different forms of uh, building culture and urban culture. And it wasn't a homogenizing force, but it was integrating force into different uh, previously separated suburbs as Chicago became one larger metropolis, both uh, physically, geographically, uh, but also ecologically, politically, and economically too. So here you can see just a typical condition on the left is a postmodern building, the uh, city library uh, that was won in competition. Um, and that was by him and Bibi and Bobka, uh, which has uh, some quite significant uh, typological exaggerations and sledgehammer mannerist postmodernism on the left. Um, but the elevated train itself, as you see it here, is just one mechanism among the many. Um, and it's been you know, renovated to, to some degree, uh, but it's still roughly the same system that was in place in the early 20th century. Um, and it allows you to move through and above the city uh, quite elegantly too. Uh, 
uh, aerial photos. Um, and this is, there's an airport out there in Mansfield. If you've seen the Eames uh, film, Powers of 10, that was shot just outside of this uh, park here, the Millennium Park. And you can see how the, the growth along the waterfront and this loop area here, um, more or less is the same configuration that it's been from the beginning since the Great Fire. The streets haven't really been modified, but the densification has been mostly from the loop north into the river north area um, and uh, up to uh, the lake itself. There was a transformation that happened in the building cultures and the urban ecologies of Chicago post-World War II with the arrival of Mies van der Rohe, um, Ludwig Hildersheimer, Willy Nagy, and other refugees from the closed German Bauhaus as they were settled in South Chicago and created the new Bauhaus. Mies educated an entire generation of architects in Chicago, transforming his earlier avant-garde and modernist practices in Germany into a much more corporate and industrial approach uh, of minimalism and abstraction for the United States in the post-war period. And this uh, return to, I guess, the structure and particularly the exoskeleton model that we like of, of closed uh, or open environments, um, entirely open span uh, spaces for the floor, uh, 360 views and access to the horizon. All of the techniques that we associate with Mesian um, post-war spaces were brought into the city, um, office buildings, housing, um, even something like uh, his uh, follower, uh, and student, Helmut Jan, when he did an economic center, even cultural institutions would follow this kind of um, elegant and austere uh, mid-century uh, corporate modernism, which became almost a default symbol for organizations and bureaucracy. At the same time that architecture firms were becoming more corporate, the architectural technologies are also being corporatized and creating homogeneity between building types um, and uh, this pervasive steel framing system uh, in its natural form of expression uh, arises in this post-war period as an entirely different Chicago school of architecture, something like not just new Bauhaus, but something that moves beyond that. And if you look at it very closely, this is uh, some of the housing towers he constructed. Um, there's a, a pragmatism that's still at play in this, but much more of a reliance on industrialization as signifier and as almost totemic object to remind people which century they're in and the, you know, the Mesian imperative that architecture is the will of an epoch translated into what he said was stone, but later glass and steel is becomes the unofficial style for a lot of the architecture in Chicago from the 1950s until the 1980s. A uh, variation of that, this is uh, one of my most favorite buildings, the Inland Steel Building, which has got a steel framing. It's an uh, open span exoskeleton structural system. Uh, it's made of everything that can be made out of steel in a building is made out of steel in this building. And it's filled mostly, at least when I was there, mostly filled with architects' offices uh, because of its uh, characteristic quintessential modernism done by SRM. It's one of the first buildings that was built after World War II. Um, and it's older than it looks. Um, so it's, it's aged quite well, it's quite handsome in some senses. Um, and the detailing on it is obviously showing some influence of Mies and the Miesian tradition. The uh, building that I always associate the most with my childhood and with Chicago is the uh, Hancock building here. Um, it was the first uh, skyscraper built in Chicago. Um, it was also done by SOM. Um, and it's the first one that has mixed use. So it has retail, housing, and office programs combined in it. And it's got, uh, as you can see, a tapering facade system and a massively expressive cross bracing um, that uh, cuts across the four different facades that taper up. And so this is an incredibly strong. I think it's got a bump and tube structure with elevators in the center as well. So this is a heightened form of structural efficiency moving beyond the Mesian abstraction into something that is more of a beginning of an expressionist a phase of uh, structuralism in skyscraper design. And as you can see, you look at it, it's obviously something that has a strong reference to not just the Mesian tradition, but also towards infrastructure itself. So the buildings start to become more and more industrial in their raw expression. And as the industrial society was forming in Chicago in the 1870s and 80s, as architects were searching for not style, but new forms of efficiency, um, in the golden age, this period of skyscraper development, and this was actually the tallest building in the world for quite a few years. Um, when I worked at SLM, actually, they found out that it was um, a few feet shorter than they had, had reported it um, as they were building the Petronas Towers in Kuala Lumpur, which at that 
she became the tallest building in the world for a while. Uh, but uh, until this was replaced by the um, by the uh, uh, Sears Tower west of here, um, the Hancock Building was uh, a tour de force of engineering and minimal style. In the 80s, when uh, postmodernism came to the city, uh, Helmut Jahn uh, shifted his architecture from a Mises approach towards this uh, almost populist, uh, slightly Venturi, but probably closer George Jetson inspired uh, modernism, uh, high tech. Uh, this is the state of Illinois building. Um, it's an atrium, a huge atrium with a building wrapping around it, done in time for the American bicentennial, so the red, white, and blue uh, colors and imagery. Uh, the structural expressionism has got more pop culture references to it. Um, the building is, is not very well liked by a lot of people, but it's actually, um, I think it was Vincent Scully, the architectural historian, said it's the only building you go into that you get vertigo looking up instead of down. But the vast cylinder space of uh, these uh, glass elevators that move through it um, as a new wave, I guess, at the time, uh, postmodern uh, return of historicism, or in this case, a transformation of the high tech into something populist. And there you are at the top, looking at the atrium and the skylight of the state of Illinois building uh, constructed across the street from the city hall um, in Chicago. That's the library building I mentioned before. This is a personal photograph, so that's why it's not so good. Um, and when that was built, uh, some architects were just horrified by the glib references to Beaux-Arts neoclassicism, almost as if the uh, Sullivan uh, Burnham debate was being brought back. And, um, and, People in the city tended to love this building because they could tell it very clearly it was a library, even at a time when people no longer went to libraries. These are construction photos. Uh, when I lived in Chicago, Frank Gehry had won the competition to design the band shell in the public park. Um, so here it is under construction that they finished. Uh, it was a Millennium Park, and I think they missed it by quite a few years. But uh, once they finally finished this uh, and clad it, as you can see with the typical Frank Gehry cladding, Chicago is one of those cities that has at least one project by most known and well known architects. Um, but very few of them had significant impact on the city, uh, except for the local firms. And so it's one of those cities that, uh, in some ways, has resisted uh, foreign species of design and uh, foreign influences of design and followed its own consistent processes, protocols, and patterns. So it's got a strong urban ecology and strong intellectual ecology, I would say, in that pragmatism. And Chicago architects were famous for not uh, reading or writing books in theory, which is my field, uh, but referring one-to-one -one wall sections and you know, exquisite detailing of the most uh, minutia, minutely uh, uh, executed and designed uh, connections and joints. Fasteners for Chicago architects are the key towards good architecture. And they used to tell me at SLM that form always follows parking. So you would always lay out the parking garage first and then put a building on top of it for efficiency. Um, so that, that kind of warehouse logic from the earliest work to modern architecture is still present here. This is the uh, Sears Tower, um, now called Willis Tower, I believe. Uh, it's a different type of a skyscraper. Uh, it's a nine square grid and plan, and each of the buildings, each of the nine are constructed uh, conceptually as their own freestanding structural tower. Um, the apocryphal story is that the uh, architects working on this uh, Fazal Khan, I think, was the structural engineer. Um, and they, uh, they, they, they used to smoke back then. And they said, it's always hard to get the first cigarette out of the pack. And then they're like, yeah, all the other cigarettes push against it. So that's where they got the idea, allegedly, for making this skyscraper, uh, which is the tallest building in Chicago to this day. Although a lot of people tried to uh, build projects bigger than this, but it still holds a title. And Chicago is a sort of place where uh, it's a city of uh, carnivores, a city of uh, people who um, don't care where you went to school. They just want to know what you can do. It's also a place that's very big on sports and sports figures are treated uh, in the way that uh, say uh, poets and musicians are treated in Europe. Um, and so this has always been the number one building in terms of its size and uh, its popularity. And contrast it with what I think is actually a much more elegant and refined solution, the number two uh, Hancock building. Again, it's a very important building for me personally as I watched it being constructed as a small boy as they broke down. And this is showing the relationship of those two buildings and the lake that extends over the horizon and the palimpsest or that layering. Uh, you can see between the, uh, in this photograph in particular, between the uh, Hancock to the left and the Sears Tower to the right, uh, you can see the Ricardo Bofa skyscraper almost equal distance on Blackbird Drive. 
and this in some ways talks about the different type of development. This is the same exact grid in the same location where the Chicago fire happened in 1871. And that whole period of history and the first buildings that went skyward um, are now lost. Some of them still exist and they're heritage buildings, but they're now lost in this larger conglomeration of the tall office building in the area still called the Union. There you can see the comparisons of those. Um, recent developments um, in terms of the uh, urban architecture as uh, the, not turned to biomorphism per se, but certainly uh, the digital turn in architecture has slowly started to influence the uh, growth of uh, new building approaches and new building technologies. Uh, but the thing that I think that makes Chicago still a, a working city is the, uh, the innovation, the fact that the building stock themselves aren't destroyed as often as they are renovated. So adaptive reuse is done, and there's a lot of design firms that take this more sustainable approach of reinterpreting and reinventing new functions for existing buildings. You can think about it in terms of not just sustainability and economics, but also intellectual sustainability. If your existing building stock, which is often well constructed, um, even during the industrial era, um, gets transformed and flipped that old warehouses and old factory buildings get turned increasingly into loft style housing as the housing pressure on the city drove real estate prices and drove a lot of people to the suburbs. One of the deliberate attempts by some enlightened members of government and industry was to try to bring people back to the city and to make cities, and particularly Chicago, a sustainable walking city. And that was quite successful in the 90s and the early 21st century as buildings were flipped and creatively reinterpreted and readapted. I worked for a design firm that was operating out of an old warehouse next to a computer software company, next to a modified brewery. And it was like all of these industrial zones that were blighted brownfields got cleaned up and got transformed into high tech hubs and to creative districts. And so this kind of gentrification was not only funded partially by the government or subsidized, they, they created their own kind of micro economies or small little uh, neighborhood ecologies too. And so the consequence of that is there's a building approach. And this is something I got to do a little bit with one firm, uh, the large corporate firms don't do this, but adaptive reuse of transforming existing buildings into new functions, this kind of flipping of loft housing and other types of industry. Uh, design firms are one of the first to pick up on these, but it involves having a knowledge of history, having a knowledge of old construction systems, having a knowledge of contemporary building codes and expectations and trying to do some of the things I think that Louis Sullivan was experimenting with at the far end of modernism at the beginning, of how to bring different historical periods, different types of ecologies, different materials, different logical systems and different technologies that were, I guess, grounded in different cultures or in different environments and put them together and synthesize them in a way that you can still read each of the parts, but not a type of entanglement perhaps where you lose clarity, but a deliberate layering of different systems in different times, something that is much more organic in the uh, Frank Lloyd Wright and Louis Sullivan level. So this approach, and you can see there's countless examples of different buildings, stock warehouse buildings that are converted in everything from offices to housing, um, using again, very tactical uses now of technology as opposed to tactical use of the element. And uh, this is a corner of the place I used to get off when I used to go to work um, in Chicago. You can see there on the right, uh, another adaptive reuse building uh, right next to the hill. And then I'll close off. I mentioned before how important sports are. Um, if you ever do get to go to Chicago, which I recommend, um, one of the best cultural activities that you can invest in is going to a Cubs game. Um, most people go there knowing that the Cubs will lose and they don't care. It's an opportunity to have um, proper uh, outdoor uh, entertainment spectacle, often having a beer at the game um, in the middle of the, uh, the vast city and one of the few surviving turn of the previous centuries, um, urban ballparks. Uh, most of the others have been replaced by super stadiums out in the suburbs, uh, but uh, Wrigley Field, the Temple of Unanswered Prayers, it was called when I was there, uh, was still accessible by walking in the city and there's a metro station right next to it. And in some ways it is also uh, something like a, uh, a heritage piece or an endangered species, I guess, if you want to follow the ecological paradigm. Um, the Chicago itself is a place where the past and the present coexist. And architecture, this is the fundamental challenge for designers. But to combine and to adaptively reuse and find new and creative approaches towards everything from uh, construction systems to new types of programs and functions and inventing new audiences and new forms of producing value. 
wider society. I'll stop at that point. And I think everyone can still see me and hear me. Um, Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, the Chicago fire was a, um, a shocking uh, situation that happened and it was publicized across the United States and across the world. So it, it burned in people's memory for a long time. And so there was a strong collective uh, social uh, push in Chicago to not just go back to what was lost, but to actually do it better. And it was only because of the everything from the uh, economic strength of the city because of the financial prosperity of, of the agricultural industry to uh, the development of new building technologies to the building codes to, you know, the strong financiers and insurance companies. It was just like a, a magical moment um, where just too many coincidences lined up and the tall building was pushed mostly by, you know, clients and not architects as a, a practical money-making solution towards the opportunity to rebuild, you know, demolished office buildings. Um, as a consequence of that, it created a golden age of Chicago architecture was called that uh, from the 1880s to about 1900, maybe a few years after that. And then there's another big push that happens um, in the 1980s as the city starts to you know, get you know, another growth spurt economically and starts to surge and uh, densification, also increasing size of the government and the loops and more government buildings. Um, so it's been, uh, the population has gone uh, to a peak and then diminished, but the great fire was that uh, unprecedented uh, accident. It punctuated the equilibrium of the city and created a new opportunity. In some places where they withered or, or rebuilt what they had and been content with it, and that's often the case nowadays, but in the case of Chicago, uh, modernism emerged out of that strife and toil and that struggle to reclaim uh, its prior reputation at the same time that the financial situation and the uh, population was still growing. So it was fortuitous that that happened. And you know, uh, if you think about what happened with say Louis Sullivan and Frank Lloyd Wright um, being involved in that period in their formative years um, as architects gave rise to this very interesting hinging condition between 19th century Victorian craft and 20th century industrialization. And you can see that fundamental tension in their work that uh, subsequent generations of architects didn't live through so they don't, you know, uh, Put it in their work in such a, a vehement and such a, a strong, um, sensible way, too. So I, I have a certain fondness for those pioneers of the modern architecture of that period. In the same way that when I worked at IIT and, and learned about uh, the American version of Mises and modernism, I developed a, a grudging respect for the, uh, the, the sincerity there in that paradigm of uh, industrial minimalism, too. But yeah, Chicago is in many ways, Chicago is one of those cities, uh, not all of the cities, but Chicago is one city amongst many uh, where you could actually teach the history of modern architecture using just examples in the city. Um, I was told the same thing when I was a visiting professor in Vienna. They said, we use Vienna to teach the history of modern architecture because most modern architects have practiced here. And I said, oh, we do the same thing in Chicago. And so we were comparing notes about that, that a lot of the uh, parallelisms, particularly in 1880 to 1910 between the two cities, even in the ornamental systems and the, the constructions. Um, there's there's you know, distant, but not coincidental parallels between the two cities. And you can also find some aspects of Chicago and Berlin um, before and after World War II. Um, uh, that one more often than not caused by architects working across both cities, but uh, you know, there's, there's very few places like a, a city. And I think it was, um, I remember the uh, architectural historian said you can recognize each city by its tempo. And so Chicago is a very distinct tempo. 
um, to it, the way that people move through the city. It's a little slower than New York. Um, it's a little more of a friend, uh, much more friendly city than, than New York. Um, and in many ways, it's got much more of a ruggedness to it than say Boston. Um, and so there's a, there's a lot of unique works of architecture and a lot of historically significant works and new technologies that we developed there. But the, the cultures of the neighborhoods and the, uh, uh, I guess the, the influx of different immigrants influenced the food cultures, the um, social systems, uh, as well as the building cultures there too. So we, I always use the paradigm of ecologies as opposed to styles, because when you talk about styles, they sound like dead, static, fixed things or patterns. But if you think about them in terms of ecologies, there's influence and there, there's relationships and there's transformations and reciprocity. So everything from building ecologies to the microecologies of the uh, office climate uh, to the landscape ecologies of the city, they do have something to do with each other and they are relatively unique in the case of Chicago still, even to this day. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But you can also see in one of the Transformers films, they have the final battle right there at the, um, uh, the jeweler's building too, where I used to work. So every now and then when I came out of working at the buildings for SOM or, or, uh, or, or Murphy Young, when I come out, every now and then they'd be shooting a film. Like one day I came out from work to go to lunch and there's Bruce Willis making a movie. <laughs> so, yeah. so you never know what's gonna happen there. <laughs> All right. I think we're out of time. Thank you, everybody. Right. Next week. All right, take care. Okay, so uh, thank you very much, everybody, for uh, listening, tuning in. And uh, next next week, we have um, 15th of uh, December at 2 p.m. EST time. And uh, next lecture, by Thomas Michal and it will be about um, ultra thin surfaces so uh, mark your calendars and uh, and uh, be there with us uh, and I will also talk in Polish so um, uh, w następnym tygodniu Thomas Michal uh, będzie uh, miał nas Kolejny wykład na temat bardzo cienkich płaszczyzn, jeśli dobrze to tłumaczę. Czyli 14 godzina 15 grudnia. Zapiszcie sobie to. I to jest drugi wykład z serii trzech wykładów z profesorem Tomasem Mikalem. Dziękujemy. Metaproli GZM za pomoc w organizacji tego właśnie przedsięwzięcia. No i także tak, że jeśli na przykład nie śledzicie jeszcze interfejsy, to jesteśmy na Instagramie, Facebooku, YouTubie i można też tych podcastów słuchać na Apple Podcasts, Spotify Podcasts i innych podcastach. Także ja serdecznie zapraszam, żeby słuchać, oglądać resztę wykładów. Także dziękuję wszystkim za wysłuchanie całego wykładu, który wydaje mi się, że był ciekawy. No i do zobaczenia w następnych odcinkach. Pozdrawiam tutaj Tomek Szyński. Pozdrawiam serdecznie. Już kończę stream.